Thanks, David. And good afternoon. How a long way for an industry to come in just 10 years, from an ancient barn just outside London in 2004 to here. But I know that the late Richard Duval, one of my co-founders, and whose barn it was, would be pleased. Now, we've had some fantastically technical presentations this morning. Uh, we've had some great slides. We've had masses of content. I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to just tell you a story. So let me take you back for a moment and describe some of the early thinking behind SOPA. And let's see if that thinking is still valid and see if it, provide, if, see if it provides any pointers as to where we might, we might go next. So there were two main thoughts back in 2004. Firstly, the bond market. Might sound really rather obvious, mightn't it? We asked ourselves, why do large corporations get a better deal when borrowing money than consumers or small and medium-sized enterprises do? After all, money isn't a commodity subject to economies of scale. A million dollars isn't cheaper than a million lots of one dollar, unlike, say, a million widgets. We concluded it was because of the evolution of the bond market, a place where large companies go and ask for money, and investors looking for a better deal on their cash lend it to them. These corporations don't borrow from banks anymore. Bank lending to large companies has been replaced almost entirely by the bond market, although interestingly, the banks themselves do buy quite a lot of these bonds. So we asked ourselves, why doesn't a bond market for consumers exist? And what would need to be true in order to create one? So you'd need reliable and trusted third-party data to allow investors to make informed decisions about risk. Well, that exists. At least it does here and in the US and in the UK and other developed markets. It's not quite the same as a credit rating for a large company, but it's highly predictive when used intelligently on a portfolio basis. I might, might not lend $10,000 to any one of you in this room, no offense intended, but I might happily lend $10 to 1,000 people who look like you based on an understanding of the credit worthiness of this population. In the same way, I might buy a bond in GE for $10,000. Also, you'd need investors who'd be happy with the kind of returns offered by this new asset class. Now, that's something that's self-evidently true in the bond market. Now, we were interested in building a financial services company for consumers because we believe that in the UK, at least, consumers are woefully underserved. What can the ordinary man on the street do with his money? We Brits love to buy houses, but not many people have the appetite to own more than one. Uh, the amateur landlord gets a lot of publicity, but actually the numbers of people doing it are tiny. Um, what else can you do? Invest in stocks and shares? Well, the average Brit thinks that's too risky, and few people have any exposure to the stock market beyond perhaps their pension, and they might not even know about that. So what does that leave? Well, your old favourite bank deposits. And UK banks are just as bad at paying, paying fair rates on deposits as any other bank. So we thought, yes, there'd be consumers looking for a return that was more predictable, and less risky than the stock market, are more lucrative than bank deposits for a touch more risk. Secondly, we asked ourselves why, by then in 2004, eBay was already the largest online marketplace in the world. We couldn't explain that growth just in terms of price or purely economic utility. There must be something else going on. And we concluded it was to do with the value that people got from working together. Let's call it a social value. So even in those pre-Facebook days, it was clear that people valued collaborating on the web. And of course, everything we've seen since then has only confirmed that view, and social value has exploded all around us. So we thought, put in a nutshell, if we could combine the somewhat dry concept of a bond market for consumers with the idea of enabling people to collaborate together to get a better deal, we might just have something. So we launched the business in March 2005. So what were the biggest barriers to growth in our earlier days, back nine years ago? Firstly, there was some weird stuff going on in the capital markets pre-crisis. And that meant that banks were lending money really cheaply, and it was hard to compete. We did have an economic advantage, but was it enough, particularly combined with the other big obstacle we faced as a new business, the lack of trust in our asset class? So you could say we were too early. Often pioneers are. But I think some of the actions we took in those early years were seeds for our later success and the success of the industry in the UK. We made a clear decision to focus on the prime end of the market not because we thought the net returns would be higher. In fact, many people advise us to do exactly the opposite and go for higher yields. But because we thought an atmosphere of defaults would be most unhelpful in the critical building of trust in our new asset class, behavioral economics teaches you that we suffer our losses much more than we appreciate our gains. And why put an immature business through the operational stress of lots of debt collection and litigation when you want to focus on growth and not cleaning up a mess? 
We also put at least as much effort into our credit models as our technology and built a risk operation that I believe is the highest performing in the world. We thought we should be very transparent. Our lenders should know who they're lending to, at what rates, and how their loans are performing, as that transparency would help build trust. We also believe that the ordinary man on the street wouldn't be interested in playing a market like some kind of city trader, but would want the easiest route to lending out money. They'd want us to do the heavy lifting for them. Now, meanwhile, over here in the US, a year later, Prosper launched and joined us on the world stage. And Ron and his team deserve enormous credit for turning that business around. But I don't want to talk about Prosper today, or even Prosper 2, as Ron told me this morning. I want to talk about Prosper 1 and what they did at the start. Now, interestingly, they did some things very, very differently to us. They made things more fun. Borrowers created listings, effectively advertising themselves, and lenders were invited to bid. Some really rich content about those borrowers was created. Returns were also eye-catchingly higher. Some of those borrowers weren't the greatest risks, but hey, people make better lending decisions than banks, and the wisdom of the crowds were the party lines. We even copied them, and about 5% of our business was done via a similar listings route. And then the world changed, and we got lucky. When the crisis hit, two things happened. Firstly, bank spreads widened dramatically and immediately. Deposit rates went down, while borrowing rates went up. And that's the situation we still find ourselves in today, seven years later. So our economic advantage grew. It became easier to offer people a better deal. Secondly, people lost their trust in banks being solid and safe institutions. Our credit models have performed well, however. Our prime borrowers kept repaying, and trust in our asset class grew. Uh, Cormac made the point beautifully, showing some um, a performance of, I think, 4.5% net returns after losses in the depths of the credit crisis. We actually found it easier to recruit lenders than borrowers, and numbers grew to the point where the platform actually became overfunded with retail money for a while. So what happened to Prosper? Now, people hadn't been making such great credit decisions after all. Headline yields have been high, but defaults even higher, again, as we learned this morning. Also, the business found it had a hell of a mess in collections to deal with, which led to significant lender dissatisfaction. Interestingly, we found the performance of our own loan listings to be way worse than our more managed service, so we shut it down. So why am I telling you this story? I think it was what led to the US platforms pursuing institutional lenders very vigorously and successfully, as it turns out. In fact, you could argue that the asset class they'd created with high yields for correspondingly higher risk was better suited to professional money than retail money, while our more boring and predictable asset class was well suited to the man on the street, exactly who we were aiming for. I think it's also contributed, at least in part, to the very different regulatory conditions in the US versus the UK. We won an argument with our regulator that our product should be available to the man on the street because it was suitable for him, while over here, retail lenders have to jump through all sorts of hoops and pass suitability tests, significantly reducing the product's marketability. What else have we learned from the US? Well, it's open we've always been transparent about data to our own users. But what we haven't done yet is encourage an ecosystem of third parties to graph around us, as has happened in the US, of which Orchard, as we heard earlier today, is a great example. So we'll be working with the guys at Allfy Data to do exactly that. And I would encourage all platforms to do the same. So where are we now? The US platforms have been enormously successful bringing institutional funds onto their platforms while getting their risk management in order. They've also learned that retail lenders don't want to get too involved or to do too much heavy lifting themselves, but want more of a managed service. I think you'll see more and more retail activity on these platforms. Even Lending Club are talking about it as they approach their IPO. So the flavor of the morning has been very much about institutional, but I think you'll see more and more retail lending on US platforms. And in the UK, well, our sector's grown nicely, both in number of platforms, many of which you'll hear from today, and total volumes, which should hit two billion pounds by the end of this month, of which a billion pounds is from this year alone. As a share of their respective markets, I think that makes US and UK numbers roughly comparable. And in continental Europe, we're seeing strong growth in France and Germany, as well as interesting developments from the Samware Rocket Internet Brothers in Eastern Europe. And you know that an industry's really got itself on the map when those guys want to get involved. And Zopra itself, we've lent nearly 700 million pounds now, or well over a billion dollars. 
And the growth in the two sides of our business, lenders and borrowers, is more evenly poised. We've had a lot of interest from institutional lenders for our safe and predictable asset class, initially from UK funds like P2PGI, but also from funds over here. And we've been using our learning to cautiously push the credit boundaries a little, improving net yields, while funds are saying they can get leverage on our assets because of our history. And that leads a five and a bit percent return into a double digit return. Very interesting for them. So I think in short, there'll be some convergence. US platforms will learn to love retail lenders again as they pursue more reliable sources of long-term funding, while we learn to work with institutional funds to help us manage our growth. But I'll never forget it's the retail lenders that got us here and we'll continue to build our business around them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack.